Okay, we are here together because the collection says data part to whole grant. So with funds from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation regranted through the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, LSU libraries and the Louisiana Digital Library is part of a cohort charged with creating examples of how to operationalize the use of digital cultural heritage materials as data. We are thrilled to be part of this cohort. So if you haven't yet had a chance to familiarize yourself with all the other great projects, I encourage you to do so at your convenience. Our part of the collections of data part to whole project is investigating what it would mean to make the entirety of the Louisiana Digital Library available as data. For context, the LDL is Louisiana's statewide digital repository for cultural heritage material. With over 30 participating institutions, including public libraries, academic libraries, archives, and museums. And we know that our project of this scale and complexity will include both a technical angle, angle in which we build out APIs and enable bulk downloads in various ways. And there's a lot of work to do in that area, and we are chugging along. But much more central to our project in a lot of ways is the community work that this entails. Because we're thinking about what we can get out of the LDL in terms of data to use and reuse in various formats, we also need to think about what we put into the LDL. And doing so invites questions about digitization selection, conscientious metadata remediation, as well as evaluations of what collections should not, in fact, be widely shared. Because we know that not everything should be treated equally, should not be treated the same way. It's because of these questions and many others that we launched this speaker series. We want to learn together. And because we know the LDL is not alone in this journey, we're so happy to see such a great turnout. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to reminisce fondly about the great semester of speakers we've had so far. You can see their names, institutions, and titles of their talks here. All of these are presently available to watch and rewatch. The links are available on the URL on the slide. And we jump right back into it early next semester with Brian Carpenter, Michelle Riley, and Sharon Leon. Details about their presentations are available again at the link you see on the screen. And I hope you can join us. It will be amazing. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jacqueline Mortemont. Jackie is Distinguished Chair of Digital Humanities and Social Engagement at Dartmouth College, where she specializes in the long histories of digital media, histories of quantification, and technologies of commemoration. Her 2019 book, Numbered Lives, Life and Death in Quantum Media, was published by MIT Press and explores the longstanding semantic inequalities by tracing the history of counting lives and deaths and how it's entangled with religious, imperial, and patriarchal histories. This year, when the full impact of the pandemic was emerging, at least in my own consciousness, I'm happy to be able to hold this up, I eagerly went back to Jackie's book to help me, at least in my own way, understand what we were counting and what we were not counting as the death tolls continue to rise. And she continues her research into who counts and why with her project, Eugenic, uh, Eugenic Rubicon, and joins us today to highlight ongoing work that affects how we think about using historic cultural heritage collections as data. And now I'm delighted to pass it off to Jackie and her presentation, Possibilities and Perils of Collections as Data, Lessons from Eugenic Rubicon. All right, um, all right, so, Everyone can see that that first screen, is that correct? Yep, great, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so thanks so much to the Louisiana Digital Library team, including uh, SL with whom I've been coordinating um, for the invitation to talk to you all today. And thanks as well to each of you who are here, either today or in the future, given that this is a recorded talk, for taking the time to listen and engage. Every time we say yes to an event, a talk, a conversation, um, we're saying no to many other things. I wanna honor and appreciate um, everyone for taking the time to think with me about how our understandings of collections, data, and an ethics of care might intersect. Um, I've got up there uh, my Twitter handle. Um, please feel free to tweet uh, at, we, at me, with me, uh, both now and in the future. Um, I'm, this is a long ongoing project, so I'm eager to have conversations. Um, as um, SL noted, uh, normally uh, when I give talks these days, I'm talking about numbered lives. Um, it wasn't something that I anticipated being quite so germane, um, but I want to highlight that um, in addition to being available in print, um, the MIT Press has made numbered lives available for free online. Uh, you can follow that URL and I'll be happy to tweet it out um, as part of their, their COVID-19 um, publications. 
So today I'm going to talk to you about a project um, that's known as Eugenic Rubicon. Um, and you'll see here, this is the um, sort of landing page or splash screen um, for the prototype book, um, prototype scalar book. Um, and you've got both my name and that of um, my co-PI, Alexander Mina Stern, who is a historian of medicine at the University of Michigan. Uh, and I want to highlight that uh, this is an incredibly multidisciplinary um, and uh, plural project. Um, it's also multi-generational, um, which is something uh, Alex and I did very intentionally. We continue to foster that intentionally, and it's something of which I'm quite proud. Um, so we have undergraduate researchers, master's students, PhD students, and PhD researchers, um, in addition to um, staff both in library and technical staff who are all sort of working together um, collaboratively on this and we've actually had folks move through masters into phd and on into um, having graduated and having um, professional positions right so we've sort of um, seen a, a partial life cycle of scholars um, as we've been working on this um, and i have here for you just to give you kind of a sense um, it's a, a formal collaboration between the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab, which is Alex's lab at the University of Michigan. Um, it also includes uh, faculty researchers from the University of Illinois, from Rutgers and the University of Iowa, in addition to my digital justice lab, which is housed at Dartmouth. Um, and we have engaged, I sort of wanna make a point of this on the uh, right-hand screen, um, in the first iteration, which was a California based iteration of this project, and I'll talk more about the difference between the first and the second iteration in a moment. But we've engaged with the disability rights California groups um, with reproductive rights organizations, both in California and nationally, as well as the education um, and programming group facing history facing ourselves, which deals with um, you know, telling difficult histories, particularly in um, the K through 12, and for our case, high school education space. So we're working, um, right, to think very expansively about who are the possible users for this resource, um, but also who are the communities who need to have a, um, uh, some stake in saying how this resource is, is shaped. Um, and want to acknowledge um, that this is the Eugenic Rubicon, um, publication portion of it, the scalar publication, is supported by an NEH HCRR foundations and implementations grant. Uh, there's a separate sort of quantitative portion of this project that is also funded by, partially funded by an NIH grant. And we are grateful to both of those organizations for their ongoing support. Uh, cool, my friend. Okay, um, I know that um, you all have been having an ongoing conversation about collections as data, but I wanted to sort of bring a couple of ideas to the fore as a way of sort of setting the context for our conversation today. The first two are from Thomas Padilla's Collections as Data Implications for Enclosure. Uh, collection, a collections as data paradigm seeks to foster an expanded set of research, pedagogical, and artistic potential predicated on the computational use of cultural heritage collections. And a little bit later in that same document, Padilla notes that as libraries and archives ramp up as collections as data ramp up collections as data development, uh, it is imperative that they critically engage with the question of ethical use vis-a-vis -vis, uh, and its relationship to the proliferation of the right to mine perspectives. And that's a, a key sort of tension that I'm going to come back to at the end of the talk. Um, and I also want to note that the second point in the Santa Barbara statement on um, collections as data explicitly notes the ethical commitments um, of data stewards to address the needs of the most vulnerable when doing this kind of work. Okay, so I wanna give you a sense of the collection scope um, for Eugenic Rubicon. And I mentioned that there had been a first phase which was um, supported by the NEH Foundations Grant. And that was largely restricted to our California collections. We are now in a second phase with the Implementations Grant. And with that grant, we've expanded our scope. So initially we were dealing with 20,000 records from the state of California that had been discovered by Alex Stern uh, during her research into the history of eugenic sterilization in the United States. The time period that we're talking about here, um, she actually has some records that go back to the 19 aughts, um, but mostly what we're looking at is between the 1920s and the 1960s. 
With our expanded scope for the implementation grant, um, we are including additional, the additional states of Iowa and North Carolina. And that's partly because of the um, focus of our partner researchers, right? So Johanna Schoen, um, who is at Rutgers University, um, is perhaps um, one of the best known uh, historians of eugenics um, for her work with the North Carolina um, records, um, which has a, a kind of interesting and complicated history um, that uh, folks may want to look into. Um, and then Nicole Novak, who is one of the people who uh, was a, a PhD researcher early on in the program, graduated and then has now has a professional position. Um, she's working out of the University of Iowa and so um, working on data that um, she's uncovered in the Iowa archives. Um, and I want to actually flag that I said I'm covered there, and I, I think that's a, a little bit of a complicated thing. It's not necessarily that uh, Nicole discovered those, right, but she's been working to think about how do we take that information from the archive, which has a very restrictive use um, guidelines, right, because of HIPAA laws and archival um, regulations. And they've had to hand transcribe all of that data, right? We're not allowed to reproduce the data, um, not allowed to reproduce the primary documents in the same way that we have for the California records. And just to give a little bit of backstory on that, um, the California records were discovered by Dr. Stern, as I mentioned, um, while she was doing research on eugenics in California, they were in an abandoned um, medical facility in an unknown file uh, file cabinet, and it was a series of microfilms, right, of nearly 20,000 sterilization records and attending materials, right? So um, in many ways, Alex did something much more like discovery, right? She found them unused, abandoned, and forgotten about. Um, but of course, they were themselves the product of um, an archivist earlier who had taken the time to micro film the primary documents which we believe have been destroyed and lost um, to uh, researchers at this point. So as I mentioned, there's a couple different facets of this project. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about most today is the digital storytelling and resource surfacing in Scalar. I assume many of you are familiar with Scalar as a web authoring platform. Um, but I can talk more about it in the Q&A if folks need. Uh, the NIH has funded the quantitative and qualitative data analysis, and I won't be talking as much about that because that's not a part of the project that I'm as deeply um, uh, integrated with, but I do want to flag that there will be de-identified normalized data, which will be perpetually housed in ICPSR repository, which is an inter-university consortial repository. Um, and that data stewardship and the repository deposits are free for researchers who are within that consortium. So thinking about data sets, right, like literally collections as data here, that's a, a site where some of that data is going. So part of what I want to focus on today is storytelling with numbers, right? Um, the reason that I became involved with this project um, was that as I was writing Numbered Lives and thinking about a, a pretty strident critique of the abstracting work or the abstraction of um, numerical representation of persons, um, I saw in the, the history of eugenics an opportunity to actually use numbers positively. Um, because HIPAA laws um, regulate that we can't be sharing personal uh, medical information um, of persons who haven't been dead, depending on which law you're following for 50, 75, or 100 years, and you have to be able to document that death in many cases. Um, the history of eugenic sterilization has been, I think, largely hidden um, much to the benefit of states that practice eugenic sterilization, right? So they can sort of hide behind the HIPAA laws such that these records are not as available. And I want to you know, sort of, we've been thinking um, in this project about care um, for six years now, um, but I want to sort of kind of rigorously approach um, the, the sort of formal practice of an ethic of care. Now, an ethics of care um, is an ethical and practical theory uh, oriented against the ideal of the autonomous liberal individual, right? And it's an ethics that derives um, the autonomous liberal individual ethics, right? That particular ethics that derives from that formulation tends to focus on individual morality and interest. Whereas an ethics and practice of care foregrounds context, interdependence, and a kind of deep listening practice. And this was a sort of uh, latent theory, as I suggested, in the early work of this project. 
We talked about how we wanted to care for the records. We wanted to care for the histories and the legacies of eugenics survivors who literally were not cared for or cared about in any sense that we could recognize in these records. We even spoke of caring for the records, records themselves, which as I suggested had been so carefully created. I mean, it's actually kind of remarkable. The 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s were a time in which, um, you know, the, the doctors and other officials who were performing these sterilizations were meticulous in their record keeping, right? So they showed a great deal of attention to the, the record keeping around sterilization while not showing, um, from my perspective, very much care for the humans um, that they were documenting. Um, so despite this enormous care for the records and the documentation early on, ultimately, as I suggested, these records were abandoned. Um, and so there was a kind of moment where we felt like, well, we wanna return a different kind of care to the records themselves. And part of the narrative thread that I'm gonna um, sort of talk with you about today highlights both what I think are opportunities and risks in um, storytelling with numbers at, when it's approached with an ethic of care framework. So what you see here uh, is the output from the more quantitative side of the project um, from a publication titled Disproportionate Sterilization of Latinos under California's Eugenic Sterilization Program, 1920 to 1945. And this is um, a spot where Nicole Novak and Natalie Lira, um, both of whom are now in professional positions, but sort of started out um, as PhD trainees uh, in this project. They were first authors on this, um, this piece. And part of what they found in the course of looking at the numbers for the California data set was that Latino men were at a 23% greater risk of sterilization than non-Latino men. And that was even after accounting for age and the historical period of sterilization. There's quite a lot of variation over the 40 or so years that sterilization um, was happening at a, a relatively rapid pace. Latina women um, were at a 59% greater risk of sterilization than non-Latinas. Uh, and I wanna note that there was no data available about gender non-conforming or non-binary survivors because of the way the records are kept. So this was, a, um, I think, a really impactful and important insight that came out of um, a data analysis of these primary archival documents, right? Um, and we've seen this um, reproduced, not necessarily with the same numbers, but um, for other um, minoritized groups in the data set as well. And one of the things that we're interested in sort of detailing in this second iteration of Eugenic Rubicon as a scalar site is the differences in states. So in California, you see a significant um, disproportionate uh, sterilization of Latinx persons. Um, in North Carolina, there's an extraordinarily uh, disproportionate sterilization of Black women in particular, right? So um, eugenic sterilization was definitely a tool of racializing and racialized control across the U.S., but it played out very differently in different states. Um, and, you know, part of what we can do with that data is get at some of these finer grain details. Now, at the same time that uh, Nicole and Natalie and the NIH team were working on this data, um, I was working with a team um, at Arizona State University where I was then uh, located under the name Vibrant Lives. Um, and we were thinking about other ways of um, getting this story out to people, right? We were thinking about literally being able to re-embody the data um, that was recorded in these records had been abstracted up to this level where um, you know people were doing quantitative analysis on it but we wanted to sort of return it to embodied feeling. So um, at the Haystack 2016 conference um, I prototyped um, a, a haptic display um, and a kind of communal feeling um, exercise. And that's the picture that you see here. Um, there is a small um, haptic device, a small um, motor essentially, that's playing a song. And that song is produced from the data that was represented in that um, study that I just showed you, right, with the disproportionate sterilizations of Latinx people. Um, and 
you can both hear the, the differences, right, by race and by age, but you can also literally feel them. And part of what I wanted to do was to move us out of a space of individual sort of viewing, um, ocular viewing of the chart, right, and the numbers, and into a communal space of witnessing, right? Um, and so what people are feeling uh, in this particular picture is a sonification um, that represents both age, so people who are over the age of 18, um, consent, and then um, race, and in particular, uh, Latinx identity. So this, um, if you happen to look at uh, or read through any of the links that were sort of preparatory for this talk, you may have already uh, read and heard some of this, but I wrote about this project. Um, in sonification and haptification for the sounding out blog. Uh, and in that I noticed, I noted that our project prompts listeners to consider how listening fits into reparative justice for the victims of sterilizations. And actually I would now change that to the survivors of sterilization. And we talked about a listening toward, right? An effort not necessarily to, not that we could listen to, right? Not that this was somehow unmediated because it's extraordinarily mediated, but a way of listening toward the history. And I'm gonna take just a minute and play this uh, sonification for you. And SL, if for some reason the sound doesn't come through, will you wave and let me know? And um, just to prep you, uh, if you don't want to listen, you don't need to. Um, this would be a great moment to mute and I'll wave when I'm done. Um, but this is the sonification that was used in that, wood, in that um, image. So we've got um, higher notes representing people under the age of 18 and those who did not consent. And all of the people represented in this data are Latinx and from the California data set. So if anyone muted, um, I'm now done with that. As I said, part of what you were hearing there, so each of the, the sort of bass beats or the note beats that you were hearing there was one record. Um, that's from the year 1940, a much compressed um, selection. And you listen to you know, probably not even a, a full year there. Um, the lower sort of bass notes are adults who consented um, and were Latinx and sterilized and the higher notes are those who were either 18 and or didn't consent. Um, and so you, part of the, the project, I think of that listening towards is a kind of sitting with um, that data, sitting with that history, literally being able to feel it um, in some instances, but also sort of experiencing um, what I find to be an incredibly difficult um, duration, right? Um, it's about five minutes long for uh, the period of uh, the 1940s, the small sample that I did. Um, and it gets really hard to listen to after a while. So I wanted to um, share that with you in part because uh, this is a space where I think we have seen both really significant insights, um, the Novak et al. piece come out, um, but also where I myself have sort of walked up to the limits of what I think an ethic of care and my community will allow me to do with this set of collections. And I'll explain what I mean in just one second. So I gave a series of uh, three talks in 2016 um, at the University of Kansas Digital Humanities event at Haystack, another invited talk um, in which I demoed the um, haptics and the sonification and received a fair amount of feedback from folks in the audiences. Um, I then took it along with other groups or other people from the project um, to the Latina study, Latina Latino Studies Association of America conference. And that was a very deliberate choice. Um, most of my audiences had been largely white um, up to that point, right? Um, and uh, the majority, even when they weren't white, um, were not Latinx or um, Hispanic persons, right? And so I felt like it was important that I go not only to people 
who are a part of the community that was being represented in that data set, but who are also scholars of Latin, Latino Latinx uh, studies, right? Um, and the feedback that I received there was very different than the feedback that I had received prior. People were very interested, they were engaged, they were troubled by the histories, um, but they weren't troubled by my doing the work. At LSA, I heard from three different scholars that they were actually really troubled by me as a white feminist scholar um, doing this work, right? Of, of using um, an artistic uh, media to represent um, the history of Latinx people um, being sterilized in California. And I'll be quite frank that initially that was a little hard to hear, um, right? And the, the, the pushback was a little different depending on the individual, um, but there was a kind of common thread of, we're not sure that you're the person to be doing this work. Um, and ultimately, right, I sat with that, um, talked to some folks, thought about it with the project team. Um, and in that project team, we also had people who were very uncomfortable with different not necessarily with my own individual approaches to things, but with different conversations that we had had about whether or not to make our documents public, how much of the archive should be accessible, et cetera. Um, and ultimately I decided that what I needed to do was step away from this particular approach, the sonification and haptification of, excuse me, the racialized data that we had. And I stepped almost completely away from it. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that an ethic of care suggests is that we we must listen to our communities, right? Um, and this listening is central, and I'm going to sort of dive back into the literature around ethic of care here for a second, is central to what Nal Nalini uh, Mouton describes as a post-colonial ethic of care. And Mouton there is citing Fiona Robinson um, and specifying that this means, quote, not just hearing the words that are spoken, but being attentive to and understanding the concerns, needs, and aims of others in dialogue. Now this listening um, of this project has entailed not just listening towards the history, which was sort of where we began, but also listening really deeply, I think, to the many communities with whom we as scholars were engaging in this work. And the early articulations of an ethics of care in the 1970s and 80s by Carol Gilligan, Nell Noddings, Joan Tronto, Virginia Held, and others was rooted in white feminist interventions. But the insights regarding the centrality of context, interdependence, and listening in care, particularly the model of relationality that I find so appealing in an ethic of care discourse, were not at all unique to white feminist thought. Right, if we think about the relationality in indigenous paradigms like those of Sean Wilson, Mary Graham, or Elizabeth La Pensee, or consider the models of relationality in the work of black feminists like Patricia Hill Collins and Barbara Smith, or more recently that of Moya Bailey or Amaryllis Estrella and Marilyn Mena. We've also had critiques of the sort of white feminist approach um, to an ethics of care from post-colonial scholars like Rupika Rassam, Daniela Agostino, Nalini Mouton, who I just cited, and Uma Naranyan, among others, who have drawn attention to the colonial and neo-colonial structures of some care ethics, including those like Gilligan's, in which white Western women's experiences are taken as a universal model of care, ignoring, and I think this is a really important point, the commodification and appropriation of black and brown women's care work in the US and globally. So Mouton, citing Margaret Walker, suggests that a po post-colonial ethics of care gives priority to being answerable in and for specific encounters in relationships. And this is, this kind of answerability is, is sort of what I want to suggest, what I think was going on in those, those LSA conversations, right? I was answerable to a community. I could have said, you know, I've had other great feedback and I'm going to just sort of march forth, but I think I was answerable to all of the communities, right? And in that, right, um, I needed to recognize what um, Gayatri Spivak uh, has described as the irreducibility of perspectives, right? I could not simply say, but look, I'm doing good things, but look, this is an important story to tell, right? The scholars who were facing me did so, right, with a, a, a 
significant degree of generosity and said, please not, please don't, please stop, right? And I think um, I needed to recognize that their perspective, however different from mine, um, was critical to the conversation, right? That if I wanted to maintain good relations um, with the community, I needed to hear um, that particular perspective. So as I suggested, um, I stopped. Um, I stopped and turned a sort of reconsideration of the focus of the work. Um, and instead, and this is the, the screen that I've got here for you, um, sort of dove back into the second iteration of Eugenic Rubicon as a, a, a scalar publication. And what we've been spending, what I've been spending my time on, rather than the sonification and haptification over the last two years, is providing thick context, right? So if an ethic of care says that part of what we need to do is attend to the context in which things have been produced, um, we need our um, scholarly and community um, resource site to provide that kind of deep context. So what you have here is one of the visualizations that Scalar makes possible. And you can see that um, we're sort of breaking out. Um, we've got the three states, Iowa, California, North Carolina. There is a eugenic Rubicon sterilization stories in America will be a consistent thread, but we're going to have information on the sterilization laws for each of the states. We're having detailed, um, but small, right? Um, scholarly pieces, but written for a, a more general audience, right? On the economics, the racialization, the medical contexts, the disability rights contexts, the sexuality and gender contexts for these different um, actions within the archive, right? So we are creating a very, um, I think, thick and deep well for the primary documents to reside in. Um, it's also the, you know, the case that we ultimately um, are not going to be providing as many of the pri primary documents as we had initially thought, right? So it's gonna be a smaller set of the primary documents in this much deeper well of contextual materials, right? So we'll have at least 30 contextual narratives, right? That help ground those primary documents that people will engage with. Um, as well as the normalized data set that it will be available um, through the eugenic uh, Rubicon site. So I think, you know, if we're thinking about listening um, and being answerable and the irreducibility of perspectives, how do we understand what an ethics grounded in these principles has to say when we're considering collections as data for research and artistic potential? Uh, one of our sections in the, the first prototype was turning people into paperwork. And so I've now added that uh, and then data. And this is a question for me. Can we think of abstraction as care? Uh, and this is um, just to give you a sense of the kind of materials that we're talking about. These are um, two examples of uh, sterilization recommendations. Um, one is the sterilization of a man who was admitted um, by uh, his father, um, right? And sort of described as having had, um, you know, kind of delusion, delusive, delusional episodes. The one on the right is a man who drank to excess and began hearing voices, but uh, had no other representations or no other manifestations of mental illness. Um, I think it's actually um, deeply troubling, right? That this person, once he became, once he's sober, no longer has the hallucinations, but they still think he should be sterilized anyway. He's a father of eight, um, a Latinx man. Um, we also have here um, the sterilization recommendation um, of a Philippine national, um, single, relatively young, um, not necessarily described as having significant mental deficiency, which was the, the, the sort of rubric under which um, eugenic sterilization um, was advanced. Even that was problematic, but part of what is, I think, kind of stunning to me as a scholar going back to these records is how few of the, the serialization recommendations even actually raise to the bar of identifying someone with some kind of heritable mental illness um, or other condition. So I wanna give you a sense of sort of the abstractions. Um, and I want to also note that these are very much in prototype form here. Um, this Justin Jock is uh, a data visualization librarian at the University of Michigan who has been working with the project. 
And what you see before you here is a, a still screenshot of a dynamic um, visualization of all 20,000 of the sterilizations in California, and they're color coded by hospital. Um, and this has been a thing that's been really important for us as a team um, is to make it visible that particular hospitals and particular hospital superintendents had discretion over how active they were with eugenic sterilization. So the dark brown um, and the light brown Sonoma and Stockton were notorious um, for their uh, vigor in pursuing sterilization. Um, the same is true for Patton Hospital, which is the purple. And I've captured here, um, there's not a lot of drilling down that will be possible in this um, visualization, in part because we decided that much detail was problematic. But you can, each of these individual dots isn't just a person, they are a person for whom we can give you some metadata, right? Um, and I know for many people, the metadata of Patton Hospital, male 24 and date sterilized will feel very insufficient. But for us, that's what felt like that's what we felt like we could do without violating the sort of relational um, system that we were in, right? In which we felt the need to, um, you know, hear people's need to not have their histories sort of shared on the open web. We've also been pursuing other modes of abstraction um, in a much more poetic vein. Um, so these are small snippets of um, material that are taken from sterilization records that I put into an interactive timeline. Um, and these ones for me are particularly wrenching. This is the um, under 17 group. Um, so people who were sterilized well below the age of reproductive capacity um, and the reasons that they were sterilized, right? 14 years old lacks the ability to conform. 11 years old, patient is an illegitimate child and stepfather cannot cope. 11 years old, mother is a prostitute. 11 or 14 years old, overdeveloped girl in general good health, right? That one in particular, um, they acknowledge that she has no other signs of um, mental defectiveness other than she has gone through puberty earlier than someone decided was standard. 13 years old, this girl was getting beyond the control of her parents, died of, an, her mother died of a nervous breakdown. 11 years old, gluttonous and really garbage, right? And part of what I hear in these is a tendency to, um, uh, medicalize and then violate the human rights of the poor, of those who do not conform right in a, in a sort of standard society, um, whether that's medically conform in terms of being overdeveloped at the age of 14, overdeveloped, um, or in terms of behaviors, um, but also those whose families cannot sort of um, engage uh, in a in the, the caretaking, right? Um, and so the strategy then was to sterilize these children. Um, we also had a different kind of poetry. Um, this was a, a series of experiments by Cassidy Gardner, who was an undergraduate at the time. Um, and Cassidy in the, uh, the, you have the patient record number and then you have um, quotes directly from the patient record. Um, and I'm just gonna read this for you. Number 3345, I am spreading goodwill, scattering flowers, communicating with God, healing the sick. A mother separated from my husband, a survivor of miscarriage. Patient 3345, destructive, a recipient of an abortion, a menace to society, recommended for sterilization. Part of what I find so powerful in Cassidy's poem here is that it juxtaposes the words of, of the sterilization survivor herself, right? Spreading goodwill, scattering flowers, healing the sick, a mother, a survivor, right? With those of the superintendent who recommended her um, for sterilization, right? So there's a kind of break there at, line, at the line patient 3345, who is destructive, a recipient of an abortion, a menace to society, right? So there's a way in which, you know, using a certain kind of poetic abstraction allows for a different kind of articulation of what's in the archive without violating um, the privacy of the individual who's represented in this archive. So, you know, I want to note um, as I close here that um, within ethics and philosophy circles, there's an ongoing uh, discussion of whether or not an ethic of care and justice are compatible. And I think that's well beyond the scope of my work and our conversation today, but I want to use an anecdote that haunts me to point to this tension as it relates to collections as data and their uses. 
Many people that I encounter in this work um, are academics or library and information um, science professionals. And very often they hold the opinion that justice demands that the, all of the history of eugenic sterilization be brought to light with as much transparency and immediacy as possible. And when we worked with a group of high school teachers during Facing History, Facing Ourselves, I sat alongside a woman as she began navigating the prototype site. And as she moved through the materials, I could literally feel something change, right? She's sitting right next to me. Her body became a bit more rigid, her jaw a little bit more set, her time on the page is longer and quieter. And I asked her how things were going and if there was anything I could do to help. Um, and she put her hands down from the computer and she quietly said, not looking at me initially, I think I need a minute. Right, And she took that minute and then she looked at me and said, I think a family member is a part of this history. And her voice shook and her eyes watered. And I quickly went from cheerful technical help to sitting with her in an entirely different mode, um, more like the one in which one sits when someone is mourning. She hadn't known about, she hadn't known that eugenic sterilization was a part of her family's history. She only had fragments of stories that had been disjointed, but as she was looking through our site, they began to fit together, snapping suddenly, um, right? We were in a high school room surrounded by a bunch of strangers. So, you know, I think that moment, right, really crystallized for me that these histories of our, that our collections are a part of are histories that we live inside of today, right? Trauma has a very long half-life. And it's not possible to know when or where the boundaries between private family histories and public reckonings will blur or dissolve entirely. And this is one of the insights of, an, of a care ethics, that the modalities and tools of the private sphere can and should structure the public sphere. Um, that what we should encounter and entangle, or what Bethany Novitsky has described as engrossment, um, we should encounter and entangle as deeply and carefully and as with with as much commitment as we do in our intimate spaces when we're doing public work. Now Padilla, I'm returning to his quote here, right? Um, notes the tension between ethical use and the quote unquote right to mind discourse in collections as data conversations. And I think it's a tension that I think we see more broadly in Western digital cultures. I would argue that an ethics of care repudiates an extractive approach to cultural heritage. If we consider the metaphor of strip mining and resource extraction inappropriate for our intimate relationships, then care ethics demand, demands that we see such structuring concepts as ill-suited to our public engagements as well. Instead, our approach should be one of dialogue and critical engagement. An admittedly slow, I mean, this project is, I think, seven years on now, uh, slow process grounded in understanding power dynamics and even the best of relationships and the extraordinarily tender work, I think, that must be done to address and redress those inequities. This is not work, I think, for the faint of heart or the impatient, but I think it is some of the most important work that we can do. Thank you for taking the time today and thank you to the thinkers and makers with whom I've been engaging. Jackie, thank you so much. This was absolutely fantastic. If you wouldn't mind, um, if you, yeah, we'll just stop sharing your screen. Mm -hmm. That way we might be able to see everybody um, a little bit better. So at this time, we can definitely take questions. Please do use the chat box. Uh, if you feel like you need, you, you, you need to speak, just put that in the chat box and we can, uh, we can unmute you as needed. Um, while, while everyone's thinking of their question, Jackie, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start with one if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned how important it was for the direction of your work and the project as a whole to have gotten the feedback from um, that one conference whose, whose name I'm afraid I'm blanking on right now. Latino Latina Studies. Thank you. Have you um, gone back to them or, or to those individual scholars in any way with, with the direction that the work has gone now to, I guess, just to check in? So we do engage with a couple of the scholars who spoke with me directly um, at that conference. I haven't been back to the conference. Um, the, in honesty, part of where, where we've been at is that we, ha we wrapped up the foundations grant that sort of marked a, a moment. And then excuse me, we um, applied for the implementations grant and we're into that and then COVID. Um, so we haven't had a chance, but we will. Um, and I know that um, certainly some, some other individuals in the project, because we're such, such a big team, people are going to LSA um, still, uh, or they were last year when we could still travel. Um, so there's still engagement, um, certainly, uh, but I haven't gone back yet, but I certainly would. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I don't see any chat questions come in and ask you another one. Would you mind speaking sure. just briefly about the, the project name, the Eugenics Rubicon? Yeah, um, right. So the Rubicon is the, the, the river once you that once you cross it, uh, right, the, the war is on, right? That's the sort of metaphor. Um, and I think a lot about, um, right, so the processes of sterilization, um, initially men were sterilized at a much higher rate than women were um, because self-injectomy, self I have a terrible time saying that word, but tubal ligation essentially um, had not yet been um, sort of approved for uh, large scale use in the early part of um, eugenics history. So um, vasectomies were quite common. And so more men are sterilized because it's a, a much less difficult surgery. Um, otherwise they had to do full hysterectomies. Um, but once you get to the spot where you where tubal ligation is the process by which sterilization happens, the sterilization of women's skyrocket of women skyrockets. Um, and literally, if you look at um, diagrams from medical textbooks in the period, or even read the superintendent's notes to family members when they're describing the processes, they describe it as just you know like crossing, you know, blocking that path right of of um, the let's see what's the i'm going to blank on the name now which is terrible um but the the tubes that lead the fallopian tubes right that lead um uh the egg into the uterus um so that it can't pass and so to me it felt like this idea of of a kind of right a crossing that, that cannot be undone of course now we know that there is some possibility of reversal but there certainly wasn't at the time right so for me eugenic rubicon sort of signals um an act on a body that was a, itself the kind of a kind of declaration of war, right? Um, both on an individual body and I think on a larger community body um, or community bodies, um, right? That that ended reproductive possibility um, for countless individuals, more than sixty thousand, um, um, but also kind of has that metaphor, right, of of blocking the river um, in a way. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I think we can we can assume it's because it's so early for so many of us scattered across the country that the questions are, are slow coming in. But I'm going to continue to stall by asking you another one, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, and this one, I, I love so much about what you described this morning for your project and so much about how you you see collections as data really being grounded in ethical concerns. Um, so I don't want to vary too far from that because I feel like that's a really important thing for us. But I have been wondering the entire time you were talking, um, this is me varying from that, whether or not, like, what, what does consent mean in, in the in the situation in which you're talking about? I know, you, you know you're talking about age of consent and you're making distinctions about who had that, who didn't. But I'm just sort of wondering, I'm sure you'll thought a lot about this. Yeah, I mean, right, so um, consent, as we understand it now, was not necessarily an active process um, at the time. Um, and certainly, um, you know, consent in a space where um, people are uh, incapacitated due to illness, um, right, is a, a, a deeply troubling uh, space. Um, we do have instances where parents did consent. Um, sometimes that's a um, an affirmative consent, right? They, they definitely want this to happen. Other times it feels a little more ambiguous, right? Um, people are not necessarily um, fully literate, right? We have people signing with X's, things like this, right? Um, I think also, um, you know, I don't wanna suggest that um, the only problem was non-consensual sterilization. There's no question that that is a problem, right? Um, but sometimes the the, the articulation of a diagnosis and then a subsequent consent raises a lot of questions. I also wanna flag that this is a period in which women were unable to receive um, voluntary sterilization, right? Um, and so we definitely, especially in the later part of the um, sort of history have instances of women who commit themselves to these, these institutions for the purposes of receiving sterilization because they're burdened by childbirth. Right. Um, it's often the case that people are given the um, the released from the mental institution that they're at if they consent. Right. And so that's a kind of coerced consent, um, you know, and, and part of the logic, which we now know is deeply faulty, was that um, if a person was suffering from, say, schizophrenia um, or epilepsy or um, some other kind of paranoid delusion, 
that they might get better if they were sterilized. There is no connection, right? Um, that it's just simply not true, right? And so um, the the notion that you could consent to something that was based in a in an irreality is, you know, further complicates the issue. Yeah, thank you. We do mm -hmm. have a few questions in the chat now. Um, Caroline says, I wasn't expecting to encounter the poetry you shared with us. The different ways to interpret the data as with the poetry and the sonification examples are very moving. Can you talk more about how it was developed to make these types of multidisciplinary interpretations? Thanks for that question, Caroline. Um, and I'm not 100% sure I know what the, the sort of like how it was developed to make the, the multidisciplinary interpretations, but uh, so if I'm if I answer way off, feel free to redirect me. Um, the team was intentionally um, multidisciplinary, right? Um, part of what I brought. So when Alex was working um, initially, she's a historian of science. She was working with um, a group of people in the School of Public Health, right? There was a fair degree of um, sort of focus on the epidemiological uh, population tracking quantitative approach um, right to the history, um, which I think is, you know, sort of spoke to the expertise in that, in that group. Um, when I asked to join, I was like, please, can I do stuff with you? Um, I brought with me a, a real commitment to um, art, um, right? Um, and to thinking otherwise um, through these, these processes, right? So I would say that, um, you know, we, we then had a kind of accrual, um, right, not just by me, but um, sort of a, a kind of, um, you know, attractive force, a kind of gravitational pull of, of people who wanted to do more creative engagements. Um, and, and that produced, right, really rich work. And, it, and be, I think because we had people who were grounded in the, the quantitative and in this more qualitative, um, you know, literary-ish, sort of space, it then made it possible for people who wanted to try that for us to say, yes, of course, go ahead and try that, right? So um, the poetry of the, the undergraduate student, right? At, you know, we talked through that. She talked about the history of concrete poetry and, and how she wanted to engage that and how that felt meaningful. And, and we were willing to explore, right? Not all of my sonifications are great. If you go to my SoundCloud, you'll hear some of them suck. Um, and that was like me, me, me trying, right? Um, and I would say similarly, the poetic experience or explorations are not all as moving. Um, so we've been very exploratory, and I think that's part of how that was developed. Right. Janine Finn asks if you found any good ways to maintain community engagement with project partners during the pandemic. It's really hard. It's really hard, even for the project team. Um, I mean, it helps that we were already a multi-institutional team. And so we were used to convening, um, you know, a little bit remotely. I will say that um, I personally feel like we really miss um, being able to be together in, in co-working and, and thinking sessions. So it had been the case that um, we would meet once or twice a year in person, um, usually in Michigan. We had planned one here um, just before COVID hit um, that we weren't able to do. And I think, you know, given that we are such a distributed team and we're calling on people's expertise and um, their own interests, right, to make this as rich as possible, I think that often can feel like a diffusion of direction, right? And so, you know, work has been slow. Um, I wish I had a good answer, but I think partly it's about being patient with ourselves um, and knowing that this is just really hard. Absolutely. And um, Kelly Rowan is wondering if these eugenic practices also happened in Europe or was this an American uh, attempt to develop a perfect society? So it turns out um, US scholars, scientists, uh, doctors, et cetera, um, were really significant innovators of eugenics and um, were responsible for exporting that to Nazi Germany. Um, so certainly we see eugenics uh, in Europe, we see eugenics in other parts of the Americas, um, right, Latin America, South America. Um, you know, I think eugenic considerations and approaches are not uniquely American, but we were vigorous in our articulation of them and in our desire to export them. Um, I will also say they're not part of history, 
Um, I mean, they are obviously part of history, but they are very much alive and well today, right? This idea of a better and most fit society, um, I think has been part of the popular discourse um, ever since Trump came into office, um, at least. Um, and, you, you know, um, I really encourage folks to check out the film No Mas Bebes, which is about um, non-consensual sterilization of Latina women in California um, at university run hospitals, right? Um, so we are not outside of a eugenic moment. Um, it's just not legal anymore here in the United States. Right. Um, Brian Carpenter asks if you can comment on the degree to which there were different access or use restrictions on the eugenics records among different repositories. Uh, and can your findings and experiences from the use of these records inform or change archival practices? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, they're really different. Um, I will say that the, so initially when Alex found the California records, those were protected under HIPAA law and they were part of the state archives. Um, they have since been relocated to uh, um, a public archive uh, in California um, where anyone could go and access them, right? It used to be a, a highly restricted access and now there's only a handful of years that are still considered under the HIPAA law. Um, the Obama administration changed HIPAA law from 100 years to 50 years after the death of a person. Um, and so, you know, the, the California records have undergone a really interesting change of state while we've been working on the project. And one of the things that I'll note is that um, we could, if we wanted to legally publish the majority of the California records in their full form, but as a group, we have chosen not to, um, per, specifically because of the kind of impact um, that we are concerned can happen when, when there is free circulation on the internet, um, right? And, and the ways in which impacted communities, right? Like, like, as I was suggesting, this is a history that we still live in, right? Um, and to have that be a history that could suddenly sort of just like pop up, um, I think is not something that, that we wanted to be a part of making possible. Now that's not gonna stop somebody else from making them available in their full form online, um, but we didn't want to do that. Um, Iowa is the most restrictive of our archives um, in that there is no reproduction of the primary documents and it can only be transcribed, but we can use the full information from the transcription. Um, and so our normalized data will have to adhere to the, the most restrictive of the, the three data sources, right? North Carolina, Iowa, and um, California. Uh, and, and it will have to be based on Iowa law, I think, um, I would need to check back in with uh, Nicole and Natalie on this. Um, I think it needs to be abstracted at a level where it can, or de-identified, right, at a level where it can't be re-identified. So if there are individual particularities that could re-identify a person, um, even if that person is in the archive where they could be seen lawfully, I think we would need to go back and, and make sure that they weren't um, sort of identifiable in that public data set that we'll be sharing. Um, in terms of like, would that inform or change archival practices? You know, the conference where Alex and I met was an archives conference at the University of Michigan. And um, the many of the folks that we met with there wanted all of the documents to be available in their full form as soon as possible. Um, I think our experience speaks to the risks of that. Um, but I think there are also um, some pretty strong tendencies to, to push back against that impulse that, that we have had as a project. And this might be a quick sort of conclusory question. Are you aware of any other instances of use of these documents by the government, the scientific community, any other groups? Um, so uh, the North Carolina records have been used in order to um, develop legislation for reparations. Um, so there were cash reparations made to North Carolina survivors that were a result of um, both scholarly and then journalistic use of the documents. Um, we, the California team led by Alex um, has also looked into the possibility of reparations and that's currently going through the, the various um, governmental processes in California. Um, the Iowa uh, records, I don't believe so. Um, I don't know, I mean, I sense in that question, right? Um, you know, there's kind of like reuse of, of 
um, genetic data and things like that that has been deeply problematic by government and scientific communities. And we don't see that to my knowledge for these archival documents. This is incredibly labor intensive. Um, and I haven't myself seen much interest um, on the parts of, of other entities, except for those who are working for, I think, um, justice and reparations. Fantastic. Jackie, I'm just gonna jump in to thank you again for this wonderful talk and for joining us and thanking for all of our audience for being here this wraps it up for the LDL speaker series for this semester. Everybody's talk is or will be soon available for watching and rewatching. Watch all of our Twitters and Facebooks, <laughs> etc., to find out when Jackie's talk will be available. Um, again, thank you all. Have a wonderful thank you very much, everyone, for coming this morning.